something incredible has been happening over the last 25 years in one of the hottest and most arid places on earth here on this 11 acre piece of land 3,000 species of plants and trees have been intentionally planted to grow this thriving forest even though it's in a highly challenging and hostile location that only receives 1.6 inches of rainfall a year and it's all because of one woman and her family who grew most of these trees from seed and have been working tirelessly to turn what was once a dusty cattle ranch into a tropical oasis in the desert and now the 17 year old son has been taking on the responsibility of expanding the forest by doing something absolutely amazing and he has been accompanied by this adorable raccoon who was rescued by the family so in this video we will be hearing their incredible story and finding out how this unbelievable transformation was made possible this project was basically farmed in a desert we traveled to a remote part of mexico to find the tropical forest growing in the desert the forest is situated just a few kilometers from the official line of the tropic of cancer the tropic of cancer runs through some of the major subtropical deserts in the world such as the Sahara Desert, Arabian Deserts and the Indian Deserts. Subtropical deserts are the hottest of desert types characterized by hot temperatures, warm soil and low amounts of precipitation. The forest we are visiting today is in the Sonoran Desert where it doesn't rain for 315 days of the year. It's a very sandy landscape defined by thorny desert shrubs and cactus. But these 11 acres positioned close to the coast on the peninsula of Baja California have been transformed into a lush, thick canopy of trees known as Buena Fortuna Gardens which is a highly established food forest, botanical garden and nature reserve with rare and endangered species from all over the world which grows a wide range of fruit trees and vegetables using highly innovative organic techniques. It all began with Kitsia Coppel Kalmana, gardener and landscaper who had been installed in school gardens, community gardens and seed banks with indigenous communities across Ecuador and Mexico and together with her late husband Gabriel Howarth, a world-renowned botanist and pioneer of the modern organic movement they decided to create a living seed bank full of plants from every corner of the world which they would plant together alongside native plants all growing harmoniously together and in 1997 the couple embarked on the long journey of turning what was once a cattle ranch into what has now become a thriving botanical forest garden in the desert. When it's very hot outside, here is a nice temperature. When it's very cold, there is a hog of nature. When it's too windy, there is protection. When it's too dry, there is water here. Places like these make the water available. The roots that tap into the water table bring the water up. But this story is also about the future of the forest and how Kitsia and Gabriel's 17-year-old son, Quetzal, is continuing to expand its growth from the very heart of their vision, the forest nursery. But in order to appreciate the work that they're doing in the nursery, it's important to understand the intention and purpose of growing a forest like this in the first place. This is a living genealogy seed bank. We have over 3,000 plant species like 2,500 of them are edible, medicinal, and useful plants. We have plants to make textiles, plants for colors, or even construction. You wanna have a seed bank like this in every town, like a place where people can come to get seeds. It's like a seed library, you know, that holds the, the story and the wisdom of what can be grown on a place. Growing plants and saving their seeds is becoming more and more important as the variety of food seeds around the world is decreasing at an alarming rate. In just 80 years, the world lost 93% of variety in food seeds. In 1903, commercial seed houses offered hundreds of varieties of seeds, as shown in this sample of 10 crops. But by 1983, very few of those varieties remained, which is why Kitsia and Gabriel started this project of growing the ancestral seeds they had collected from all over the world in order to preserve and protect them for the future and the seeds they are producing are highly adapted to the local environment and are able to resist heat and drought and as a result of this 
The forest they have grown now has a range of interconnected benefits. It produces a diverse assortment of fruits and vegetables, massively reducing dependency on imported food, which is extremely important for remote areas and in a time when shipping and trade restrictions are increasing. Plus, the fresher the food, the more healthier it is. The forest is also benefiting the climate and the environment by holding water and creating shade, which lowers temperatures, as well as increasing biodiversity and providing habitat for wildlife, as the forest is now home to a wide range of birds, mammals and insects. So it is very important to have these green spots all around in the planet. You need to have a seed bank, you know? The heart of this project has always been its forest nursery, where thousands of different types of trees and plants have been nurtured from seed or cuttings to grow this amazing forest. And today, Kitsi's 17-year-old son, Quetzal, is following in his parents' footsteps by running the forest nursery, where he has grown thousands of new trees and plants from seed to continue to expand the forest. My name is Quetzal Howard. This is the nursery and I transplant plants and then I plant them from, from seed, propagate them, and after we plant two in the garden. The forest nursery is an incredible operation. And as Quetzal grew up in the forest his parents were creating, he's picked up how to grow all sorts of tropical trees and plants. Quetzal has a stunning succulent collection and recently built this succulent and cactus mountain garden. This is my succulent collection. I've been collecting them around three years. The forest is in an ideal climate for growing succulents and cactus from all over the world. This one, that's a calanchoe. I really like the, the form like a dinosaur. This is a succulent landscape. We put like two pieces, I think, of palm here, and then some leaves, branches, and lots of that stuff, and then some soil, and then some sand. And then we started planting. We put the wood inside because it's good for the soil, because it gives nutrition to the soil, like bacteria, fungus. This one? The star of the flies. The la estrella de, la, de las moscas. It makes like a flower that is like a star, a big flower. It smells like rotten meat or something like that, really stinky. So the flies come and pollinate the flowers. But one of the most amazing things happening in the forest is the number of oak trees he is growing. Incredibly, Quetzal is cultivating native oak trees from the high mountains of Baja California, which he has grown from seed by collecting their acorns. Mexico is a mega diverse country which is the largest number of oak tree species in the world, where 160 species of oak trees can be found, of which 109 are endemic, and they play an extremely important role in the ecosystems. However, they are becoming more and more endangered, and are rarely cultivated, so Quetzal is taking care of the future by growing these important trees for the country's biodiversity. Be sure to follow Quetzal on his social media so you can keep track of this exciting, up-and-coming new gardener and landscaper. So how do you grow a forest in the first place? Well, kids here explained to us that they did it in a series of phases. First of all, you inventory what you have. Like, uh, always respect the native flora. I get to understand that. Second, compost and fertilization. There's different elements. One is like star making compost, very important. But also, um, there is something that is called green manure, which are crops that can feed the soil. We use Crotolaria and Sesbania quite a bit. And then we also did uh, Calypso peas. Cajunus cajun is the Latin name. Very good plant for fertilization. And also Lucaena. So it's compost, green manure, and also foliar feeding. You know, when you plant baby plants, then you make viol, which is like a liquid compost. There's different preparations, like whether it has seaweed or worm casting hummus, liquid, and then that gets supplied on the leaves of the plant. The second phase was the nursery, the propagation of some key plants that we wanted to put on the property. The third phase was the design and the planting. The first six months, it was focusing primarily on feeding the land and seeing what we had here uh, as natives, pruning them to use them as nursery plants. 
and we planted the fruit trees. And then as the fruit trees start growing, eventually we took some of the natives out. We now have very well established food forests. Like there is always at least three or four different things that are being harvested. The forest has several eco-buildings and Kitsia's partner Victor, artist and musician, is in charge of construction and they are currently creating a new farm-to-table restaurant. We're opening up a restaurant. We're planting most of the food that we're bringing to the table, so we call it seed to palate. The structures that we are building here for the restaurant, we try to use as many natural things from the land that we have. We started using clay and cob system. Victor has also been caring for the latest member of the family. This is Mappy, a raccoon they rescued, who was found abandoned in the forest as a baby. About six months ago, this baby raccoon shows up two steps away from the door. It was the morning, like at seven o'clock in the morning, got up and Kitsi was like, hey, there's a baby raccoon outside. I, was like, what? I left it there for two, three hours because I felt that the mom dropped them and she was going to come back and pick them up. But he was only like three days old. He couldn't walk and she wasn't coming to pick him up. His wrists were super weak. He, they were not strong to move. So he just kept on moving on circles. And I decided to pick him up since they didn't come to get him and realized that he had little mucus on his eyes and he was kind of like with an eye infection. That's when I realized that she had left him on purpose because he was sick. So I took him to the vet, started taking care of him and we're, we're best friends now. He's, he's super comfortable with me and I'm comfortable with him. In part two, we'll be diving deeper and taking a tour through the forest with Ketsia. We will also be learning about the water and irrigation system and how the forest cope with 10 hurricanes, as well as seeing more of their adorable yet cheeky raccoon. So make sure you're subscribed for that. And remember to follow Ketsal on his social media. The links are in the description of this video. Thanks for watching.